What is the difference between these two CAT scans and is one more concerning than the other? Merry Christmas, everybody, and I hope Santa brought you guys everything that you wanted. Now let's get into our case. Yesterday, I presented the case of the Grinch, who followed Santa down the chimney to steal some toys and fell about 10 feet onto his head. He was found at the bottom of the chimney and he was flexing his left side. He made incomprehensible sounds and was not opening his eyes to pain. So I asked, what is his GCS? The Glasgow Coma Score or the GCS is a criteria that we utilize to help stratify head injury patients. Our patient did not open his eyes. He had incomprehensible speech and flexed on the motor response, giving him a GCS of eight. And in terms of stratifying this type of injury, he has a severe head injury. Okay, so what does that mean? Anyone with a GCS of eight or less is identified as a severe head injury and should be intubated in order to protect their airway. Given the fact that we knew in the field that this patient had a head injury and had a significantly decreased GCS, what types of things could paramedics do in the HIP field to help improve the outcome? Number one, if the patient can be safely intubated in the field, that would be ideal because his GCS is eight or less. This will help prevent hypercapnia or increase CO2 levels, which can increase your intracranial pressure. If a patient has a head injury, we don't want their carbon dioxide levels in their blood to be too high. One thing we can do in the field to help prevent hypercapnia is to slightly hyperventilate the patient. If able, elevating the head of bed to 30 to 45 degrees can also help. But in this type of trauma situation, most likely spinal precautions need to be observed. In that type of situation, one thing that you can do is reverse Trendelenburg the bed to help elevate the head of the bed. This will help increase venous return and therefore help reduce intracranial pressure. Another thing you can do in the field is keep the patient's head position very straight to increase jugular vein return to the heart, which will help reduce intracranial pressure. I stated our patient was intubated in the emergency department and went for this stat CT scan that showed this acute subdural hematoma. Also, what we see on this CT scan is a significant amount of midline shift the middle of the brain is right here, and you can tell that the middle of the brain should be right here. So this blood clot is significantly compressing the brain, and that can lead to impending brain death. Time is of the essence because time is brain. In the first part of this video, I showed these two CT scans to help us delineate the difference between a subdural hematoma and an epidural hematoma because they are very two different types of head bleeds. An epidural hematoma is classically an arterial bleed or a fast bleed that happens traditionally from a skull fracture. Whereas a subdural hematoma is a venous type of bleed, which is a slower type of bleed. The location is slightly different and we identify them as epidural versus subdural because of that. An epidural hematoma actually happens between the skull and the dura. Subdural happens between the dura and the arachnoid. Why does that even matter? It matters because it can help us identify them on CT scans where an epidural hematoma classically has this lens type or convex type of bleed and a subdural hematoma has a more crescent shape. Because of the location of the subdural space, a subdural hematoma can lie more diffusely across the brain, and an epidural hematoma is more trapped between the skull and the dura. The dura is really adhered to the skull, so it does take a lot of force, like by an artery, in order to create a hematoma in that space. And because of that rapid arterial bleed, you can have this type of lucid interval where the patient will essentially be talking and then be unalive. So if a patient comes in with this type of bleed, you need to be very hyper aware that this can massively expand very quickly. Now let's get back to our patient and we identified that he has a large acute subdural hematoma causing midline shift and compression of the brain and his GCS is eight. When he fell down the chimney, he tore those bridging veins and laid at the bottom of the chimney and those continued to bleed until he was found. He needs to get to the operating room and he needs to get there right now. If emergency intervention is not taken quickly, this patient will progress to brain death. One thing we might notice if the patient is not taken to the operating room is that their ipsilateral pupil or the pupil on the same side of the bleed will dilate like this. 
and this is a sign of brain herniation. What we do when we take a patient to the operating room for this type of bleed is we take the patient's head and lie it where the side of the bleed is facing towards us. We then prep the skin, we then take a scalpel and incise the skin and reflect it back to expose the skull. We will then take a drill and make several burr holes and then use an interconnecting foot plate circumferentially cut the bone that we need to remove. We will carefully peel off that skull to expose the dura or the covering of the brain. Now traditionally in a subdural hematoma, we will probably remove a larger portion of skull than what is shown here. Once the dura is exposed, we can then use a knife to cut the dura and that will allow us to access the area where the bleeding has occurred and we can remove the clot, coagulate any of those veins that are bleeding and then close. Now, what we will then do in that circumstance is look at the brain and see if there is a lot of brain swelling and if there is a lot of brain swelling, often we will leave off the skull to allow the brain to swell outside of the skull and that could save a person's life. Now, in some instances, there may not be a lot of brain swelling and we think it's safe to replace the bone flap back on. The difference between those procedures is if we replace the bone, it's called a craniotomy. And if we remove the bone and leave it off, that's called a craniectomy. In a craniectomy, the patient would have to come back for our second procedure to have the skull replaced. In a craniectomy, the patient's skin will then be closed over the brain and the skull will be left off, but we would have to come back when the swelling has gone down anywhere from four to 12 weeks to replace the skull that was removed during the initial surgery. Our patient's case, we performed an emergent craniotomy where we were able to remove his skull evacuate the clot, and then replace the skull back in place. After his surgery, within a few days, he was awake and was able to be extubated, and he was subsequently discharged after about a week in the hospital. He went on to make a complete full recovery, subsequently returned to Whoville, and his small heart was said to have grown three times that day. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case, and Merry Christmas from my family to yours.